this in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer. This is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory shall fill the whole earth, Revelation 18, 1. For it is the work of everyone whom the message, and notice she identifies it as well, a message of warning has come to lift up Jesus. And of course, the whole article needs to be read. Well, I'm going to go way down to the very last. By the way, this revival that started in the summer of 1892 moved into the college in Battle Creek. W.W. <clears throat> Prescott got up and was convicted. He got a testimony of Ellen White from Australia about the resistance to the message still, 1892. And he felt personally convicted, even though he was promoting it now, he initially had risen up against it. And so on the last day of school, he decided to read a portion of this testimony to the student body at the last chapel meeting on the last day of school at Battle Creek College. And when that chapel was over, students were free to go home for Christmas break. 350 students. And W.W. Prescott, the principal or you know, the, the president of the college, gets up and he reads this statement from Ellen Ryder, you know, a few paragraphs. And then in tears, he confesses his resistance to God. And again, like a tidal wave, 350 students stayed from that noon chapel meeting until 10 o'clock that night, sharing their personal testimonies and what God was doing in their lives. You can't take a whole student body on the last day of college classes and keep them for 10 hours. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. I, I don't care if it's a rock band. You can't. You can't. Even, you know what I'm saying? It, God was moving. That spilled over into the review. It spilled over into the 1893 General Conference. So I'm going to end with this question that W.A. Colcard asked. And this was in January, 1893, in the midst of these revivals. And he asks a question in regard to Ellen White's statement that the loud cry had begun. And this is what he says, something for us to ponder. Why did the loud cry begin with a work for us rather than with a work from us? Why did it begin with the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, the sin-pardoning Redeemer, among us? as stated by Sister White in the review, rather than with the cry from us to the world of the fall of Babylon. So then he answers his own question. An answer to this, these questions may be of interest, but the answer is easy. When I first read this, I, I had no idea what he was going to say. But notice what he says, the Lord saw that we ourselves needed a fitting up before we were prepared to do the work he designed us to do. Amen. He saw that we needed to know the gospel, the power of God unto salvation, what it is indeed, before we could preach the everlasting gospel in power and demonstration of the Spirit to others. And to know and to be able to tell from personal possession what it was that the churches had lost before we could tell the world the cause of their fall. How can you tell the world Babylon has fallen? Number one, if you don't know who Babylon is or what they've fallen from, if you don't know by personal possession and experience what they have fallen from fallen from? How can you call people out to an experience? How can we do that to an experience we don't have? That's why God came to them first. 
Well, that's just a broad airplane view of some of the revivals, 1892, just barely scratched the surface. Um, at Vespers, I want to tell a story that may illustrate why where those revivals ended and why we're still here in 2021. Thank you so much, Ron. Do we need to stretch? You guys want to stand up? Take a couple deep breaths. Samaritan. 
you'll say, well, how could that possibly be? Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was not just by lineage a Jew, though. He was also of the lineage of Ruth, who was a Moabitess. And he had in his lineage, on his human side, the murderers and the prostitutes and the publicans and the sinners and the wretched who had come down in those two lines that came down to Jesus' lineage. On one hand, you have the line of the Father, and he is his son. But on the other line, you have the lineage of humanity, and he is the son of man. And they blend in the person of Christ. And so the more I look at the person of the Samaritan, you know how the, the Levite and the priest, they come by and they look at this man and they pass by on the other side. It is not an agreeable duty and they cannot, when they look at this man, they cannot tell if he is a Jew or if he is a Gentile. And so they feel no obligation. It's not certain. Right? He's naked and he's full of blood and he's got a broken nose and I can't, you know, I, can't, I just can't tell. Therefore I'm absolved. And the Samaritan comes, and I want you to listen to me. Uh, listen, listen to the word here as it talks about the nature and the, and the characteristics of the Samaritan. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. So the first mark is that he had compassion, which is something that the priest and the Levite did not do. They would have stooped to do the duty had that person certainly been an Israelite. But the Samaritan actually has compassion. He is moved with a feeling of the infirmity, the sickness, the, the, the injuries of this man in the ditch. And the Samaritan went to him, verse 34, and bound up his wounds and poured in oil and wine. He poured in oil and wine. Oil is the Holy Spirit. The wine is the blood of Christ, right, in, in symbolic language in the scriptures. And set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, notice how he departs. He leaves this man who he has rescued in the care of a delegate, of an innkeeper, and says, when I come back, and so it is interesting to me that there are characteristics of the Savior in the Samaritan. Number one, he has compassion. Number two, he pours in oil and wine. Number three, he takes this man to an inn and cares for him. And when he leaves, Jesus left. He has ascended into the heavens. But he says, I will come again. And I will pay everything that you have spent for that injured man. Who is the injured man? If, we are, if, it, if there is some merit to the idea that Jesus embodies himself in the person of the Samaritan, who is the injured man? He is surely us. He is surely us. And he says, I will come again. And everybody who has worked for the salvation of that man in the ditch, for the saving of humanity, I will surely repay. Right? Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me. To give every man according to his work, shall we? And so, you say to yourself, well, that's very interesting. But what does that have to do with freedom of conscience? I'll tell you what it has to do with it. It has everything to do with it. Because the religion that we are called to practice is not just the religion of some uh, a person who has died, he was wise, and he is dead, and he is in the tomb. But it is the religion of the everlasting God. And God would not ask us to practice this religion if he had not practiced it himself. Mm -hmm. And so God has a religion which he must live out. God has a religion which he must exercise. And if you will, God has liberty of conscience, freedom of conscience, which he must exercise. And he has exercised, and he is our example. And so I think that when we talk about the, 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 the subject of freedom of conscience, we must look first at God. And how he has exercised his decision making. Yeah. All right, now if you will turn with me to Genesis chapter one, we're going to go real quick here. Genesis chapter one. Genesis chapter one, one, one. 
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And so, God in the beginning exercised His will to create. And inherent in creation, there is risk. Because God is creating beings, i.e. humanity, which have free will. And so He exercises His freedom of conscience to make man in His own image. And to take the risk of making creatures who can choose to go against Him. If you go with me to John chapter 3, verse 16. We see here the well-known verse that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And when we read this, we think about freedom of conscience from our own perspective. We think about freedom of conscience because it is our right to believe. Whosoever believes, that includes me. I can believe. You can believe. My neighbor who does not know the gospel, they can believe. But there is another component to John chapter 3.16. Because you see an act of the will from the Father. For God so loved the world that He gave. And that is an exercise of freedom of conscience. Mm -hmm. Because He takes His beloved Son who is the express image of the person of God. And he gives them, he gives him to a wicked world. He gives him to a wicked world who he knows is going to abuse his son, who is going to hate his son, who is going to torment his son, who is going to deny his son. And he gives him anyways for our sakes. And so when it says that we, whoever we are, that we can believe, you have to read it so that, it so that you see that God believes in the principles of His kingdom such that He will give His spotless Son to a wicked world. And that this is an exercise of freedom of conscience. Where does our freedom of conscience come from? Why, what is it, and why is it important? It's doubtless the case that we have faculties, we have a mind, we have a mouth, we have ears. And each of these faculties is given to us by the Creator, so that we can understand, so that we can see, so that we can hear the Gospel, the principles of, the principles of His Kingdom. But our right to exercise these faculties and have liberty of conscience so that we will choose. They come from the deity, as Raymond used to say. They come from God Himself. And He has exercised them for the sake of humanity. Now, I talked about the line of people coming together in the person of Christ. On one hand, you have all of the line of the descendants of Adam. You have the patriarchs. But every single one of the patriarchs was a sinner. Every single one of the patriarchs was a sinner. And they come down through this line into the, on the human side in the person of Christ. And then you have God. And how when Jesus was born, He was filled with the Holy Spirit from His birth. But that mixing, that mixing of humanity and divinity is the secret to salvation. Our salvation. Because He became us. In Catholic theology... God sends His Son, but the Son does not come to humanity all the way. That's why you need the intercession of Mary and the saints. That's why you need the intercession of the priests. Because that line of divinity does not come down and fully embrace humanity. Right? And it's very interesting that the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception comes out of that time period at around the same time the Advent movement was getting going. 
where the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception was is that Mary was born in a sinless state. And the Reek says it doesn't have to do with Jesus' sinless state. It has to do with Mary's state. So that when Mary becomes pregnant, she passes a sinless nature, a unfallen nature, to Jesus on the human side. That's the whole point of the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. And so you have the mingling of God with humanity, but it stops in Catholic theology. And that's why you need Mary, you need the saints, because they make intercession to bridge that gap between Jesus and fallen humanity. Alright? And so, the question of liberty of conscience, wrapped up in God's Son, and how far He came down, I want you to turn with me in your, in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. And in speaking with Raymond before he passed away, Raymond intended to go over this, some of these, these verses and these principles when he returned in the fall. We're going to read a number of texts in Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2. Let's start there, verse 16. For verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Amen. Wherefore in all things, verse 17, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to help those or to succor those that are tempted. So what was his nature like? It was the seed of Abraham on the human side. So how far did he come down? How far did he decide to come down? He decided to come and take upon himself the seed of Abraham. And I think about the Samaritan and how there was nothing antiseptic, if you will, about his rescue of the man in the ditch. That man was covered in blood. He had broken bones. And the Samaritan had to go down to that man and he had to wrap him and gather him in his arms because he could not move on his own. And he had to gather him up and put him on his beast. Jesus came all the way down. And that is the secret of our salvation. And he decided to come all the way down so that he could rescue us. A few more verses in Hebrews. Uh, if you turn over with me. Um, to verse 14. Of chapter 4. Hebrews 4 verse 14. Seeing that he. We have a great high priest. That is passed into the heavens. Jesus the son of God. Let us hold fast to our profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. There's a double negative there. He's saying, we have a high priest who was touched with the feeling of our infirmities and was in all points tempted like as we are not yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Brothers and sisters, it is the fact that God gave his son and he came all the way down to get us all the way down to the depths of our infirmity that gives us the boldness to come to Him. Because there is no gap between the Son of God and us as human beings on the human side. He has embraced humanity. Again, what does this have to do with freedom of conscience? It has to do everything with freedom of conscience. Because if you serve a God who came all the way down to rescue humanity, and take humanity upon himself. What character does he want to give us in the service for humanity? The problem with the priest and the Levite is that they did not recognize that man as their brother. They did not recognize that man as a fellow traveler. But Jesus has identified himself with humanity. And he has taken upon himself the publicans and the sinners. And he decided to do that, which is the essence of freedom of conscience. If you turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Let's start with verse 
one here. This is right after the faith chapter. And of course, there is no chapter breaks. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your minds. I had a call with somebody in one of the, the high offices in our church regarding some of the things and the decisions that have been taken place in our church with respect to the, uh, the mandates. You all understand what I say about it. I say the mandates. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was upset. And he did not address my upsetness. What he did is he, he had me read. Actually, he quoted to me Hebrews chapter 11 and then went into chapter 12. And I just had to listen to him. This is how his response to me. I'm upset about what's going on. He, he, he responds with Hebrews chapter 11. I'm thinking to myself, where is he going with this? This is where he's going. Look unto Jesus who endured such a great contradiction of sinners against himself. Amen. You know, the essence of freedom of conscience is exemplified in our Savior. He created, and then Revelation 13.8 says that he stepped forward and he took the place of humanity. Right at the fall, right? The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. Amen. The just for the unjust. <clears throat> and then he came and he ministered as a man. For three and a half years, walking as we walk. And he decided to do that. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, please. To Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. This is my final text here. My final thought. Verse 40. So Jesus and his disciples have come to the Mount of Olives. They have come to Gethsemane. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that you do not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from the prayer and was come to, come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. What, what amazes me when I contemplate the exercise of freedom of conscience of the Son of God, which is the, the point of this talk. Yes, your freedom of conscience is important. Yes, you have religious liberty. Yes, the martyrs all died for it. Yes, this, founded, this nation is founded on the principles of religious liberty. Yes, yes, yes. But we don't get anything that does not come from us as a gift from the Savior. Amen. And what amazes me and, and just astounds me is that the Savior, when he went into the garden and he was by himself and he was praying for the cup to pass from him and his disciples were sleeping and he had nobody and he knew that the horrors of the cross, that the horrors of a false trial, to being spit on and his beard plucked out and hit and buffeted and mocked and scourged, that when he knew that all of that was directly before him, he decided 
that for the principles of his kingdom, he would go forward. Amen. Though everybody forsook him, he decided he was going to go forward. Praise the Lord. And so, if you are sitting here today and you are upset, if you are upset at the state of some of the things happening in the world, in Christianity, in our own church, remember that the essence of Jesus' freedom of conscience was that he went forward 